see this new generation, I, I'm, I'm praying that we just all manage to coexist, man. Drake went from this to this. I got enemies, got a lot of enemies. He went from this. Hey, you know, Wayne can sit here and tell you, like, I'm a gangster. You know, I could rap about that gangster life, you know. I, I can't do that. To this. Becoming a guy that was, you know, definitely willing to do some terrible things. What happened? Drake has the most unique story in the history of rap. You have this Jewish kid in the non-existent Canadian rap scene coming from Degrassi looking to penetrate the ultra competitive rap scene of today. The most vulnerable rapper ever writing poetic letters of heartbreak to the women of his past. Every one of rap's all time greats is a street savior. Rapping about the dope game, murder, and being all out gangst. Outside of Eminem, he's outsold everybody. Kanye, Biggie, Jay-Z, Pac. So how did he do it? Today we gonna answer that question. And we also gonna look at how he sizes up against the all-time greats. And what changes has he had to make over the years to stay competitive? And what's up with OVO? The ghostwriting allegations just disappeared. And what about cash money? How did he get paid? And how does it feel to be the only rapper to just pass your mentor, Lil Wayne? Every all-time great has had to do three main things in order to ascend to the top. And the first is establish respect. So when do you see your first disc coming? Uh, hopefully like back to school times, like you know, early fall. All right, no, you think I said disc. Disc, oh, disc. Yeah, when, when do you, I heard oh, like wow, this me not gonna I'm reply. I'm a nice guy. Now man. somebody's gonna send a I'm shot I'm not like you, you man, I'm a, I'm a <laughs> No, 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 I'm a nice guy. <laughs> you are a nice guy. I'm not, I'm with, you know this, this, see this new generation? I, I'm, I'm praying that we just all manage to coexist, man. Everything's good. We're all doing our own thing and have our own lanes. Everything's lovely. This man was totally unprepared. This is competitive for me, you know, it's sport. I thought we was family with OVO, but these niggas never paid me a dollar after they stole my way to trying to hide me from the world. Coach Vulture, a snake ass nigga, a nerd, a dweeb, everything. He's like, boy, you wouldn't just believe what happened. I'm like, what? Uh, did he just slap Drake? Big Mel write all his ish. When y'all find out, you'll be saying, a lot of people I look up to be like, dang, you ain't right. Found out you don't write your own well, who, do, who don't write? Who? A lot of people don't write. Really? Is it that bad? Yeah, it's that bad. You said in war, he held fuck your baby's mother's mother? Yeah, that was hard. <laughs> that, was, that was hard. <laughs> <laughs> if you want enemies, be successful. I'm convinced Drake came into this game with a pure heart. But Biggie said it best. More money, more problems. Just about every Drake beef you know about, was rooted in jealousy. Drake never wanted beef with anybody, but he had to adapt. Most of his enemies were rich, powerful, and gunning for his spot. So instead of trying to out gangster the gangsters, he hit them where it really hurt. You guessed it. Drake didn't come in the gang threatening to put hits on people and getting rappers drug out the club. The Drake you hear on Mob Ties is the result of an evolution. I think I should note that the one beef that Drake could have avoided was Pusha T. Pusha T's actual problem was with Lil Wayne and Drake threw the first shot and jumped into that beef. So Pusha T is excluded from this part. But more on that a little bit later. With Drake being just a normal kid from Toronto, and don't miss me, Toronto was no game, but Drake was a normal kid. How could he come back at these ultra thugs that was coming at his head? Even if it was just lyrical, how was he supposed to attack? Now let's be clear, Drake has always had some form of protection. He came in the game with Jay Prince. And as the years would go by, he would eventually form enough strategic connections to basically have his own army, but more on that later. So when Drake couldn't out gangster or maybe even out rap his opponent, what did he do? Go for the checkmate. All right, I mean, were you guys dating at the time? Drake and I was getting to know each other. Yeah, so we, we kind of, you know, dinner, concert, song with dolphins, what people do when they're trying to get to know each other. The beef with Drake and Joe Budden was purely artistic. Joe would criticize one of Drake's albums on his podcast and Drake would respond in a song. They would go back and forth a little bit and eventually Drake would stop responding. Joe would drop diss after diss after diss to no response and that would be that. Probably because Drake knew he had the checkmate with his girl. Not to mention that for every one record that Joe Budden sold, Drake probably sold a thousand. But still, you get my point. But don't miss me, Joe Budden is nice. Real lyricist, real hip hop, I respect him. This beef just wasn't a fair fight, if you ask me. But that's beside the point. What we're talking about is Drake's primary tactic when he gets in the beef. He used Nicki to get the edge against me. He did it again when he had his riff with Common when he famously rapped on 4 p.m. in Calabasas, dissing both Joe Budden and Common when he said, it's on like, can I get a favor or what my 
that. Costa Correa, so I got a kitten. At that time, I think it was the Drake, Serena situation. I didn't know what was going on with that. Unfortunately, the war might have been over a girl, even though at the time I never said that. And let's not forget the love triangle with him, Chris Brown, and Rihanna. Or the love triangle with him, Kim Kardashian, Kanye West, and Chris Paul. Okay, maybe not Chris Paul, but you feel me. He also used this strategy with Pusha T. Ring on you like Virginia Williams. Virginia Williams is Pusha's fiance. That one cost him. At one point, he had differences with The Weeknd, and it was rumored that he had spent some time with The Weeknd's girl. So this is probably why Kanye said this in his Drink Champs interview. You said in war, he held your baby's mother's mother? Yeah, that was hard. <laughs> that, was, that was hard. <laughs> and this ain't the first time he's done this with Kanye. In 2016, he was spotted with Amber Rose. He also doubled up on Chris Brown because Chris accused him of dating Karuchi. Look, I'm not the tabloidy type, but I just want to make a point here. In all seriousness, this is how Drake survived. This is not a play that everybody can run, but it worked for him. And of course I know that all these dudes sleep with the same girls and all these girls sleep with the same dudes in the industry. And at some point we gotta hold some of these women accountable that are also using Drake to get back at whoever they were mad at too. And we also know that sometimes dudes don't care if you smash their ex, it's no big deal to them. So it's not always potent, but now we're simply making the point that he overcame all the rap's gunslingers by being a gunslinger of a different kind. So whether you like it or not, whether you're a conscious rapper, R&B singer, or thug, you had to take this into consideration before you engage Drake. The ladies is only one element of how Drake managed to gather the respect he felt he needed. Things started to take a darker turn as time progressed. Let's take a closer look at OVO and extended family. Because I don't, I don't necessarily have like, you know, the same stories as, as Wayne, or I don't have like that. Like you said, you know, Wayne can sit here and tell you like, I'm a gangster, you know, I could rap about that gangster life, you know? I, I, I can't do that. I can only rap about like my, like my Jewish mom and like, you know, like the girls that I take on dates and stuff. So. But this wouldn't be the case for very long. Now I'm not saying that I think Drake has become some mafioso mob boss, no. At the core, Drake is still that Jewish kid from Toronto. And that Jewish kid has a lot of mouths to feed. And some of these dudes eating off Drake are wolves. And Drake is either their biggest or only means to an end. And Drake is a multi-million dollar brand. So if you begin to interrupt that steady flow of cash, you're not just messing with Drake, you are messing with everybody that's eating off that brand. And Drake has shown that he will share his platform with those that he cares for. Check out what he did for Kodak. The other week, that nigga sent me bitch a quarter to me and all of them, man. For what? For no reason. I don't even know. It was like, I want to set up a Bitcoin wallet. That fuck nigga sent me with 6.6 .6 coins. And that's not even his family. Imagine what he's doing for those he came up with. He's developed a sense of loyalty from his fam to his community. Just think about all the artists that he's lent his platform to to help break out over the years. I mean, seriously, just think about it. Drake is smart. Half these dudes come from nothing. And you got a guy putting money in their pocket, putting them on stage, giving them the look on the song, a lot of times giving them their best selling song or album. Would you not have some sort of loyalty or allegiance to that dude if somebody was pressing him? Of course you would. I mean, anybody that wouldn't is basically a joke. And the number one person who really feels like this over everybody, Jay Prince. Yeah, Jay Prince's involvement and like him still being so involved in your life and in your career. Well, Jay Prince is like a father to me, um, and he takes anything to do with me personal as if I'm one of his sons. Mm -hmm. So, you know, that's what being tied in is. You know, we're just, you know, I mean, anyone that knows Jay Prince knows what he offers as a man, and that he's, you know, a true man of respect, a made man. So for those of you that don't know, Jay Prince is basically the closest thing we have to a rap godfather. He founded Rap A Lot Records in 86, and he's behind groups like UGK, Bun B and Pimp C, or Ghetto Boys with Scarface. If you look up OG in the dictionary, it's gonna be a picture of his face. His son, Jazz Prince, discovered Drake and connected him with Lil Wayne. Universally a respected guy, someone known for handling his business, especially in the streets. This becomes a critical alliance for Drake because when he has issues like like getting his money out of Birdman or somebody doing too much in the streets, this is the man he would call. Drake is his investment. He's here to protect the investment. At one point, he even made a song called The Courtesy Call where he called out Lil Wayne, Birdman, Diddy, and others for having issues with Drake. Here's a little clip. By the way, Lil Wayne is a His manager is a drunk. And his lawyer 
is a thief. So fuck all of them together. So Lil Jewish dude didn't have to be gangster. He has an army of loyal supporters that will take your head off if you come at him wrong. So now you understand why coming at Drake like this was a bad move. Have you ever ever heard in the history of hip hop a man that gives all his creativity and helps make billboard hits but doesn't get paid a dollar for it, one credit for it, and you're stuck in the hood? You know what I'm saying? That doesn't make sense. But exposing these niggas will make sense. Fuck you bitch ass niggas. This is bitch. Oliver is a fucking snake ass nigga, double headed snake ass nigga, psychotic looking motherfucker ass nigga. Always stirring the pot, telling me you're on, I want to be at the music video shoot with Drake, they don't want me to come. All Drake's friends hate you, Drake doesn't like you. You're always stirring the pot, you bitch. So this is Mo G. Apparently he worked with Drake, wrote some songs, or assisted on writing some songs, and wasn't paid. Said they offered him $500. Also claims that Drake stole one of his dance moves. When he didn't get what he thought he deserved, he went public bad idea. As you can see, it didn't really go very well for him. So his situation reminds me of like a Quentin Miller, right? Reportedly, Quentin Miller accepted $5,000 a month to write songs for only. Let me drop some game on these youngins real quick. If you sign on with a record label as a W-2 employee and you take a salary, you have no rights to the earnings if a song explodes. If a song blows up, those are not your royalties. You already got paid because you are an employee. If you want to be able to participate in the earnings from a song, you need to own that property. Think about it. If you work for Apple and you're sitting in your cubicle and you come up with this new idea for the iPhone and you send it to your boss and he sends it to Steve Jobs and it comes out and does well, you think they're going to give you $50 million to cut the profit with you? No, you're going to get your same $150,000 and go your ass home. Now, if you want to participate in that $50 million, when you get that idea, you need to go make sure you own the intellectual property. Once you do that, you can come to them and negotiate as an owner and participate in the earnings. But when you're being paid for a service, that is what we refer to as a work for hire. If this thing makes money, you ain't got nothing to do with that. Get your business right and you won't be getting your ass whooped. Hey, somebody tell Drake to shut the fuck up about that shit, man. She never even fucking touched me. I pressed his ass. His fucking bodyguards got them. I ain't gonna hold you. His bodyguards went to town on the kid. But his bodyguards, they not his bitch ass. He ain't touch me. He's a bitch. You know that. So this is Dran. He wrote the song Cha Cha Slide. I like the Cha Cha. And he says Drake stole that song and turned it into Hotline Bling. Whether or not that's true and all the ghostwriting allegations from Drake, we're going to deal with in the next chapter. So stay tuned for that. But if you listen to what he said, he said he pressed Drake. And then he got beat up by Drake's bodyguards. Now, if you're Drake, why would you be in the club fight? These dudes want to call Drake a bitch and this and that and the other. And I get it on some street shit. I understand where you're coming from. But when you're the biggest artist in the world, you're not going to be in the club fighting unless you're an idiot. And then there's this guy, Detail. He says Drake let his boy Chubbs beat him up over some sort of contract dispute. He sued Drake over that. Then there's been reports of even fans saying when they come across Drake, they get knocked out by his bodyguard. Or the brawl with Chris Brown over Rihanna. Or even being linked to the murder of XXX. Maybe I should do a 20. Maybe I should break that 20, do a 10. Break a 20, get two 10s. Add two fives, get another 10. And 10, 10, 10 in Roman numerals is XXX. And then he came with this next bar. If he held his tongue on that live, he'd be alive again, damn. So OV everybody in OVO suck my dick. Besides party next door, I follow party next door. This coming years after X was murdered, which makes it even more suspicious. And on top of that, Drake was recently summoned to the murder trial of Triple X. We don't really know why. Cause simply be because they had beef or well, it could be something deeper. We'll find out soon. On top of that, Drake has dropped several lines that could be misconstrued as triple X disses after the murder. Maybe even confessions in some cases. Even I thought the man confessed. I'm gonna keep it a buck with you. Some of the bars just felt that obvious. Not to mention this message that X left on his Twitter page and then later said he was hacked after he deleted it. But this ain't the place to really dig into that. The point I'm making here is Drake has definitely taken things to a different place. So again, Drake is not doing the dirt himself, but it seems like he's been moved into a place where he's been green lighting it and his team is taking that. When I really break down the issues, when I started to sort of stop thinking from such a confrontational, paranoid, violent standpoint, I started to just really break down. What, what's our issue again? What is this over again? Mm -hmm. Like, is it, it's over a fight we had in like 2009 or it's over a... You know, it's over the fact that we're from the same city or it's over, the, you know. It's not a fun life when you're like just in a lot of beefs with people. You know, you got to check on who's going to be at an event. You start moving different. You start, you know, um, 
I was changing. I was mm. changing as a person, mm. um, becoming a guy that was, you know, definitely willing to do some terrible things, definitely moving with a different energy. And, you know, like I said, it's just not a fun life when you have to just look over your shoulder all the time. But thankfully, he had a change of heart. He got back to his little Jewish dude roots, made peace with all his enemies, and got off that nonsense. Salute to Drake for that. But now you know. Drake has been able to use his team and the people around him to establish respect. So point one, he got it. Let's move on to point two of being a real hip hop great, resilience. One of the main ways that Drake has separated himself from the average rapper is that the average rapper relies on the bullshit the headlines, the fights, the beef, and the drama to power their career. In Drake's case, he relies on the music. And that's no different from every other great. All of the greatest artists in hip hop history have been known first for the music. And it might not be your cup of tea. You don't have to necessarily like Drake, but you know Drake for hits. Everybody said everything you could say about Drake. He's been called lame, he's been called corny, all these different things. And he's human, so I'm sure it affects him to some degree, but for the most part, I don't think he cares about these things. Drake's first album was titled Room for Improvement. From the very start, one of his primary characteristics was to be human, humble, approachable, and vulnerable. And from that day to this one, he said the same thing publicly. I just want to be myself, which is why the memes and things and all the people who don't really rock with him, he gave him this line right here. Know that I don't make music for niggas who don't get pussy, so those are the ones I count on to diss me or overlook me. And even beyond that, if you look at the numbers, clearly more people like what he does than don't like what he does. So all that is secondary. We're not even going to get into that. Where Drake has had to be resilient, there's three situations. The first, cash money records. The second, push a T. And the third, is the battle for the top spot. Not just any top spot, not the Billboard top spot, but the all-time greatest rapper top spot. So we're gonna start with the latter. We're gonna figure out where Drake sits in the GOAT conversation. Then we're gonna move over to discuss him and Pusha T, and we're gonna finish this chapter out with Cash Money. So if we're gonna talk about greatest of all time, we gotta do it right. The greatest of all time discussion comes in four categories. The first is unanimous all-time great. Then there's the arguable all-time great. Then there's the rap legends, and then there's the future all-time great. Unanimous all-time greats, it's only three. Biggie, Jay-Z, Pac. Arguable all-time greats, you got Lil Wayne, you got Nas, you got Eminem, you got Kanye West, and I'm sure y'all could think of several more. If you want to talk about rap legends, several different categories. You got 50, you got Too Short, you got Rakim, you got Snoop, and of course, several more. And then you got your future all-time greats. We talking J. Cole, we talking Kendrick Lamar. For me, right now, Drake is an arguable all-time great. He's beyond J. Cole and Kendrick as a future all-time great. He's beneath Biggie, Pac, and J. He's above all of the rap legends. He is an arguable all-time great. But what holds him back from being a unanimous all-time great because if we keep it a buck drake has taken music to a different place he can sing he can rap he could do a smash with alicia keys a smash with rihanna a smash with bad bunny and then hop on a track with hove my personal greatest of all time He's the second highest selling rapper of all time next to Eminem. His Billboard game is crazy. All types of records on Billboard for singles and smashes and just nonsense in that space. I think the fact that Drake sings and does music from other genres is a plus. A lot of hip hop heads don't like where he takes the music. I love it. I like what he talks about. I like the fact that he raps in a way that is largely accessible to women when he chooses to. I like the fact that he dropped Honestly Never Mind, a straight dance album. Because on some real talk, y'all can't do that. You can't be mad at this man because he could drop a dance album and it chart number one, then he come back within months and drop a trap album or a street album and it chart number one again. Like, why you mad at that? Let that man live. That is greatness you are witnessing. When Andre 3000, who's also one of the greats, even though he's not listed here, decided to drop an experimental album and dress like a white woman from the 50s. We applauded that man. We should embrace and applaud Drake's ability to go in multiple directions. Simple as that. Most of the greats have given us a classic album. So has Drake. Take Care was classic. Don't at me. Furthermore, his hooks and singles defined the whole era through the 2010s. It was all him. And at this point, he's no longer competing with rappers. 
Drake is competing with himself in the future. At this point, he's conquered rap. Right now, he wants to know how far he can take it and how original of a footprint he can have when you look at his body of work over 30 years. He's so far ahead of this game, he's about to start another life. So you're probably thinking, if the guy's that good, why is he not on your list as the unanimous greatest of all time? Well, like, you are silent in all black issues. Drake, you really are. You are really, really silent. I don't hear about anything. You don't stand for nothing. You don't say nothing about nothing. You don't. It's just what it is. Like, you, and you got, you have all the platform in the world. I would have all of your fans if I didn't go pop and I stayed on some conscious shit. I would have all of your fans if I didn't go pop and I stayed on some conscious shit. A lot of people speculate that that line was directed at Kendrick. Either way, I take it as a confession. I'm choosing not to speak up because I make more money as just an entertainer. I would say this is Drake's only failure. When it comes to his career, this is the only one. Now, ghostwriting allegations and how he handled his son, I'll give my opinion on that stuff later, but I see that as different. Because hip hop will not allow you to ascend to that unanimous great conversation if you don't speak for the people. Let us not forget Boogie Down Productions, Public Enemy, Ice Cube, N.W.A., Pop, to name a few. And that role right into another issue Drake has. Hip-hop wants their greats to be hyper-masculine savior types. Drake is not that. He says it himself. Could it be time for us to rethink what hip-hop ultimately represents? Could it be okay for Lil' Jewish dude to come into the music and bring something to us that we haven't seen before and be universally recognized as the greatest of all time without ever busting a gun, without ever sending a threat, and without ever stepping up and saying he is the representative of black people? I think we'll accept it without the violence, but I don't think hip hop is ready for an all time greatest ever that doesn't give his voice to the people. This was the most dangerous moment in Drake's career. He had to make a decision between continuing to be God's plan Drake or follow this yellow brick road and see where it go. And I think he made the right decision. Not out of fear, but out of wisdom. This was one he couldn't control. Pusha wasn't gonna stop, and the layers that would have to get pulled back in order for this beef to continue were gonna be detrimental to both sides. When Push dropped the diss, you got distracted. The cover art was Drake in blackface. But blackface is something that slave owners used to use when they wanted to portray a black character in a play or in theater, but they didn't want to deal with black people because they were slaves and less than human. They would paint their faces black. And the history of blackface is that it's always been portrayed by people who are not black because it is essentially an insult to black culture. And here you have this picture of Drake in blackface. This never got dug into, but had this situation become the topic of discussion, I don't know that Drake wouldn't have at least taken a hit. Now, Drake has ironclad brand, right? He's been able to survive the scandals and all of that. But this is something that could have really gotten into the fabric of who he is because it would have questioned his real authenticity as a black person to allow yourself to be in blackface. He was young. I'm going to let that be what that is. I think it's good. We don't know where this could have went. And here was the explanation he posted. He said, I know everyone is enjoying the circus, but I want to clarify this image in question. This was not from a clothing brand shoot or my music career. This picture is from 2007, a time in my life where I was an actor and I was working on a project that was about young black actors struggling to get roles, being stereotyped and typecast. The photos represented how African Americans were once wrongfully portrayed in entertainment. Me and my best friend at the time, Mazin and El Sadiq, who is also an actor from Sudan, were attempting to use our voice to bring awareness to the issues we dealt with all the time as black actors at auditions. This was to highlight and erase our frustrations with not always getting a fair chance in the industry and to make a point that the struggle for black actors had not changed much. That's a good explanation, but I'd like to see that project. Right. Well, I don't know. Let's see if he has something or whoever filmed it, because he's not a director or a producer, so he's an actor. And it's interesting that, you know, uh, he felt like that about black issues in 2007. I haven't really seen him be standing up for black issues since he's been in the industry. I really don't know. I'd love to see it, too. I mean, it's easy to just say things when, when, when the, when the fire is when, when on. When the fire is on. That's what I'm saying. Plus, Drake's platform is significantly larger than Pushes, And even with the diss song and the revelation of the child and the revelation of the woman, it had virtually no effect on Drake from a commercial standpoint. Push is a masterful lyricist, and Drake said himself, the chess move of this one was crazy. I think he just smartened up and decided to step back. But this was the most dangerous moment of his career. So the third and final piece, be an anomaly. In other words, be one of one. Drake is absolutely 
one of one. You've been hearing me call him Lil Jewish Dude throughout this thing. That's not to be disrespectful to Drake at all. It's just to draw the illustration that this kid is just a dude from Canada with a dream. He didn't get shot nine times. He didn't have a whole East Coast, West Coast beef to catapult him into the spotlight. He's just a kid in his room writing raps. I mean, check him in his interview. Dude ain't even got shoes on. Drake is just being himself. And if anybody's still stuck on ghostwriting allegations, you stupid. Because we know if you give Drake a beat and stick him in the room by himself, he's gonna come out with what you asked for. His pen game is unquestionable. Check the credits. Every person in the all-time great discussion is one of one. Eminem, Jay-Z, Broadest Business, Kanye, the most talented person in music, Lil Wayne, all of them, one of one. But Drake is anomalous for a different reason. He's one of one because he defied all the odds. He doesn't embody any of what we want from hip hop traditionally, and he ascended to the highest levels. He went from that room with no shoes on as a little Jewish dude, and now he's standing next to Hov, Ye, and all of the greats. To me, that's arguably more anomalous than somebody who comes from a traditional cut from the cloth black experience. Not to mention he's outsold everyone. And with Wayne's help, he's taken the torch from Wayne and become better. And I say Wayne's help because he had all kind of issues that kept him from just being focused on the music. But he let Drake take his spot. Kanye has outsold Jay, but he hasn't taken Jay's spot. All I would say to Drake, if I could say anything, keep showing us what you could do with it, and don't forget that you have a voice that can change generations. Use it. Holla.